why do we see so many service dogs? Right? Not. I shouldn't say that. I'm going to rephrase that. Why do we see so many dogs with service dog vests who cannot stay next to their person and even their people and these are the these are the fakers these are the bs guys right i see them at gold's gym i see them at the restaurants i see them at the mall and their dog is over wagging and saying hi to this person and getting cookies nothing worse than a service dog taking cookies from some other person right i can't mm -hmm. imagine anything worse than that <laughs> and i'm going into a seizure and i drop dead you know i swallow my tongue because because the dog isn't there to work me out of the seizure or whatever the dog is designed to do Guys, I got a really interesting, great show for you tonight. This is a very, very different topic, and it's a topic you guys know I'm so passionate about. I'm crazy passionate about this topic. You know how I hate, I detest fake service dogs and the people who take advantage of the system. So I've been forever trying to figure out how to talk about this in a, in a context where it's a little bit less personal and actually has some validation. So I've got two guests on the show that are um, extremely well-versed on the topic. I've got Michelle Cole. She's from the International Association of Canine Professionals, where I'm also a member. I spoke at the conference. Um, Michelle is the chair of the Service Dog Committee. So the, the idea really is I want her to talk about how, what is a service dog, how um, IACP, which is a, an organization for canine professionals, dog trainers, um, groomers, uh, anyone who handles dogs, um, how they're determining that. And also I've got Christy Smith, who Christy has trained service dogs, real service dogs for many, many, many years. This discussion is really gonna hit home on a lot of topics that people should know. People are scamming the system, it's BS, it upsets me to the nth degree. Um, I call people out on it all the time. But let's get to the bottom of it. So, ladies, thank you so much for being on the show with me. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to start with um, either one of you guys can, can jump in. But let's start out. We're talking here. We have to differentiate between service dogs here in the United States and what they might be anywhere else in the world. So we can't determine what a service dog is in Germany or, or, or Sweden or Switzerland or South America or Mexico, Canada, whatever. We're going to really stay stuck here in the USA today. Right. Our whole topic is going to be this. Um, either one of you guys jump in and tell me um, how we define what is a service dog. So the American with Disabilities Act um, in the United States um, has a clear definition of what a service dog is. It's defined as a dog that is indiv individually trained to perform a task or a service for an individual with a disability. And so the key thing to take away is that dog is individually trained for that individual person who has and, the disability. In, just tell me what it means individually trained. What, what does that mean? So all the training that is done for that particular dog is based on the individual um, with the disability and what service that particular person needs. So you would need to individually train a dog such as a seizure response dog. So if the individual has a seizure and then what that seizure looks like and then what tasks that dog would need to be trained for that particular person as well as um for like guide dogs you know those dogs are trained to guide an individual who is visually impaired navigate mm -hmm. them around you know their particular environment so it just can't be a dog that has yeah just basic training. It has mm -hmm. to be a dog that has, has been identified for an individual and that individual's disability is what the dog is being trained to help mitigate. Okay, so Christy, tell me, because you've got immense background in this field, um, what does it take <clears throat> as, as a professional trainer? Because people come to me, they say, will you sign off on this dog being a service dog? And I, I just say, no, I don't, I don't, believe, in, I don't believe in lying. Tell me what it takes for you as a trainer to train a service dog. What, what is your background? What is your knowledge, your skill set for that? 
So number one, I have to be, uh, you know, have to understand the medical end of things. And I do have a medical background, both in human medicine and in veterinary medicine. Um, so I also am able to evaluate the dog to make sure that it can do the tasks that it needs to do to mitigate that disability. Um, we, it takes about 2000 hours or better um, to easily to get the dog to where it's even able to function properly in public through distractions and begin working as a service dog in training. Um, they have to have basic and advanced obedience as well as uh, great temperaments, great structure, um, as well as um, be able to perform the task work independently without being asked each time, but they have to be able to also do it when asked to task. So there are some that they have to task without being asked, such as somebody who's having a seizure or diabetes. Um, I do a lot of scent work with the dogs I train um, because I do a lot of uh, mental health stuff as well as seizure response, uh, cardiac and diabetes. And so there's a lot of scent work involved there. There's not scent work involved with uh, mobility uh, dogs. So that's a little that's a little different, but the mobility dogs have to be evaluated based on the size that they'll be when fully grown and whether that's a match for handling the mobility work needed for the person with the disability. So there's a lot of size equations and stuff we have to do to make sure that the dog is a fit. Um, they have to have medical testing done to ensure that they're healthy, um, that their bone structure is going to be able to handle uh, the jobs as well, because some of those times they're on their feet on hard surfaces, you know, up to eight hours a day as they're working with their individual. Um, these are not the dogs that get to go lay on the couch. Typically, they're out working, they're doing stairs, they are um, climbing up and down, they're pulling people up, they're getting items that the person needs to help get them dressed. They're opening doors and cupboards and all sorts of things. So the dogs have to be very athletic as well as smart um, and have great temperaments. Um, the biggest component that I find that's the hardest component to train is the person. Mm -hmm. um, this is not just about training the dog. You have to educate the person. The person with the disability has to be educated on what their rights are and the expectations of behavior from their service dog because they are a dog after all. And if this, the training is not maintained, then um, they can backslide a little bit or have inappropriate behaviors in public, which we don't want. So you're saying 2,000 hours to get a dog to be a service dog in training, right? Exposure and, all, and such, right? Yeah, that's leading up to actually taking them into public and doing the, the basic um, service dog task work and public access work in public. Let, let's, let's go through that for one second here, Christy. Um, you're saying 2,000 hours, right? And, and this is for, it, it doesn't really matter at this point. We're just going to say to be a service dog in training, whether it's going to be a mobility mm -hmm. dog, a seizure alert dog, or whatever, right? Correct. What, what happens at a point, let's say 1,000 hours in or 700 hours in, this dog's not cutting it? We wash it from the program and we place it in a home, in a pet home, typically. Okay. Or, you know, sometimes they're, going to make a good therapy dog, but not a service dog. Mm -hmm. So we evaluate and, what's going to be best for the dog and for the individual with the disability. And in your years of doing this, um, you know, as a professional service dog trainer, how many dogs make it from beginning all the way through and become service dogs percentage wise out of 100%? Probably about 70%. I'm really oh. fussy when I do my evaluations. Mm -hmm. So I have a very specific testing procedure that I put the dogs through and that I continually put them through in those first um, first thousand to, to 1500 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I wash them pretty quickly if they don't um, meet my standards. And what are their common, I know we're looking for certain traits, are there certain breeds of dogs that are better for service dogs and certain ones that are not as cut out for it? 
that gets a little tricky because I've trained just about every breed there is. No, I'm sure. Um, I mean, and some but... some have. It's really the individual dog. Sure. Um, with scent work, I tend to like dogs with longer noses. Um, I don't uh -huh. tend to use brachiocephalic dogs for any type of service work just because they struggle physically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our herding breeds, our sporting breeds are typically the most popular and from mm -hmm. they seem to be the ones that want to work with man the most, mm -hmm. where sometimes our other working breeds do not want to work yeah. with a person consistently. You... They want to work independently like a terrier. Yeah, yeah, we think a terrier. Do you do you start mainly with puppies or do you start with adult dogs too? I have done a few adults, but I prefer to start with puppies because I prefer to shape the behaviors from the get go instead of having a dog that's been corrected for doing things and then re teaching them to do some of the items right. we need them to do. Got it. And what would be, let's say, the top three, two or three or four service things, services that we are seeing service dogs for nowadays? A lot of mental health issues, um, mobility, diabetes, seizure so responses. When you, say, when you say mental health issues, tell me what a mental health issue, like PTSD? PTSD, anxiety, uh, manic episodes, depression. And can, maybe this is something that Michelle can jump in on. How do we differentiate between a mental health issue service dog and an ESA. So it goes back to what we had said at the very beginning that um, dog being individually trained for a specific task. So an emotional support animal, an ESA, just by the nature of a dog, they provide that um, comfort to a human, but they're not train specifically to mitigate that person's disability. So mm -hmm. it's a, and a lot of times um, the person has actually been clinically diagnosed. So they have a, a diagnosis of PTSD or anxiety, um, autism, any of those things. It's not necessarily you have self-diagnosed yourself. Um, okay. So yeah. that because you need to, especially with mental health um, individuals, or the veterans that our service dog organization works with, you are in active counseling. And mm -hmm. so the, the service dog is an adjunct to that counseling. And so right. as you are, are working through your, your, your issues that you have with your disability, with your mental health provider, the dog is there supporting you, but you're also working with a clinician. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, so the difference really, and an ESA is not covered under the American with Disability Act. They do not have public access rights. Mm -hmm. um, where a service dog does. But do you think a lot of people lie about that? They have an ESA. Look, personally, my dogs are ESA animals because I feel better whenever I have a dog around. But that right. doesn't qual that doesn't that's not fair. Um, and I think we you know we've all over the years at some point said, oh you know I'm going to take my dog in the store and it's, it's a service dog. Um, I just I have an issue with people who do it. I really do. Um, I think again I was telling uh, Michelle earlier on that Jimmy, our black Labrador, he was a guide dog, um, career change guide dog. He had issues with, you know, he, he had potty issues. So they failed him. This dog is the most bulletproof dog I've, you've ever seen. I mean, there's nothing that phases this dog. People can walk by, dogs can walk by. He does not engage. And that's, in my opinion, what, and I want to talk more about that. Um, that is what I think a service dog needs to do. A service dog needs to be focused on the task of the service, not getting cuddles from somebody else and getting, you know, cookies from somebody else and playing with the other other service dog there. Um, I think that all gets into the line of BS. Um, how do how do OK, so let's talk about for, from the side of IACP. Um, is IACP going to like authorize people to be service dog trainers, give kind of a certification or a, something like that? I'm just curious how that's going to work. So we actually have a certified service dog trainer 
program um, already in existence within IACP, and Christy and I are both CSDTs, that's the acronym. Mm -hmm. um, we also have developed a program that was launched you know, two years ago where we have um, trainers who are interested in becoming authorized administrators for the public access test. And so Michelle, that was in 2018. So it's been 18. actually four years. <laughs> <laughs> My house I guess with right. COVID, I like lost those. Those yeah. years of COVID, I guess, are gone. <laughs> so um, so anyway, so yes, IACP, the Service Dog Committee, has been working um, tirelessly on developing programs um, because our mission is education um, and helping further those individuals that are working with service dogs to get their certifications so that it's, um, we believe that in the future, a certification will be required. And so we're, we're just working towards um, offering those programs for individuals who, who want to you know, take advantage of them. Right. And, and, and Christy, with your background, do you see that any specific type of people like lean towards that kind of work? Like what makes somebody want to be a service dog trainer? It's obviously a passion, isn't it? It is. Um, gosh, everybody, I guess, has their own reason for getting involved in it. For me, it was a way to give back to the community in a way that I could see some positive results. I do a lot of search and rescue and uh, we don't always see positive results with that. Not good outcomes other than, no. you know, helping families have closure. So mm -hmm. for me, it was a way that I could contribute back and give back to the community in which I could see the results. Um, the first service dog I ever trained was for a child that was autistic and was a runner. And with my search and rescue background, it was really easy to teach the dog to track. And then we taught it to block and keep the child from opening doors and things like that, because the child could figure out how to get every lock they put on the doors um, unhooked. So sorry, my headphones are moving. <laughs> so um, that, you know, that was a really positive thing for me to see that and see the life changing uh, effect that it had on that child's family. So um, that's so what got me runner, started. And then it the, just the, escalated so the, from there. Christy, you said the, the, the child was Oops. a runner, not, not like an athlete runner. Sorry. Um, you said the child was a runner, right? Like not an athlete runner, but like a person who tried to escape. Yeah, yeah. An they call him an elopement risk. So, but Got it. he was more than that. He would crawl out windows and he would just full bore run and sprint. So the dog was taught to not only trail him, but also to block him from escaping out windows and doors. And once the dog was in place, the parents were able to relax a little bit and have quality of life because the dog prevented the child from eloping. And how, how long did it take you to train that behavior, or that, that, that trade into the dog? To, to get it where I felt it was reliable, it took a good two years. Wow. Okay. I mean, I think, you know, I want to address that because you're saying 2,000 hours, mm -hmm. which in my opinion is pretty much, isn't that two years? Well, that's a, that's a full-time eight hour a day job, pretty much. That's my point. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. The, I mean, it's not the dog is constantly doing the behavior, but the dog is constantly exposed to things, is being engaged. Is being, right. It's being right? shaped for its job. And what kind of dog was that? The one who did the, uh, the, 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 that the was a lab. Stuff? Yeah. It was a lab. Yeah. I mean, how either one of you guys jump on this, um, how important, and I know we always say this as trainers, we always say, well, it doesn't, it depends on, the, it's the individual dog. But we know certain groups, certain, you know, breeds of dogs are more predisposed to being better at, you know, being biddable, obviously. Um, I think a lab is a much more biddable dog than a Malinois. I think it's, you know, it depends on how you're going to work the dog more than a Rottweiler. What do you see as being um, some of the breeds that are more apt to certain things? Like, let, let's say, for a stability dog, obviously you would want to use something more like a big gold or a big lab or something like that. Um, where where do the different breeds come in here? <laughs> um, well, I think it goes back to, yes, biddability. And so in the work that I've done, um, the Labrador retrievers are generally 
um, one of the most widely used ones. They're the most accepted breed of, because for us with our veterans, our mission is to get the veteran back out into the world, into their communities and stuff. So a Labrador is just a more, you know, it's a more approachable dog, not that we're asking people to approach the dog, but mm -hmm. if you see a Labrador out in public, you you don't have the same reaction to people from people that you would if it was a German Shepherd or mm -hmm. a Malinois, right? Mm -hmm. Because those dogs um, are typically seen like in law enforcement. And so mm -hmm. it's public perception of the dog. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times too, um, the it really goes to what the dog's job is. Mm -hmm. So again, for mobility, I mean, you need the, the dog has to have the structure and the size, like Christy was saying earlier, to do the work of, you know, assisting that person from, you know, laying flat to seated to standing. Mm -hmm. And so it just really depends. I mean, a lot of people use poodles. Poodles are a highly intelligent dog. Um, but we like Christy also do our temperament testing of puppies. So even at seven, eight weeks of age, you can actually see the if that dog has the basic foundation to want to actually work mm -hmm. and have the confidence and the resiliency, which is a lot of it too that you know a dog can have a reaction but how quickly do they recover from that reaction oh, yeah. so as you're as you're temperament testing puppies that like we do i mean you're putting them in a in a stressful situation and you're continuing to ask them to do things that they might never have done before and so how does that puppy respond to that increasing pressure you know, do they shut down? Do they just sit on the floor and freeze yeah. and can't move, right? So, what, so what would you say on this is, let's say nature versus nurture. What's your, what's your balance on that? How much of it is nature? How much of it is nurture when we're looking for picking a service dog? But a lot right. of the, the natural behaviors, I had Pierre Wallström on who's, who, do, who has an amazing German Shepherd breeding program in Sweden. And, you know, we were talking about how a lot of times you get a dog and you kind of want to push it through and of course, you know, we're trainers. It's not hard to teach a dog to mask an innate behavior, but it's still deep down inside and it's always going to be there. How much, in your opinion, Christy, maybe you take that question, um, is the dog just, you know, I can kind of mask it. The dog is kind of sharp. The dog's kind of, you know, reactionary, um, doesn't recover that well, but we can kind of mask it. How much of it is nature? How much of it is nurture in this pr type of thing? I think it's about an 80 20 split, quite frankly. Okay, on which side though? So 80% nature. Yeah, okay, I'll go with that. Yeah, 20% yeah. nurture. I deal with um, a lot of some breeders that, um, because the doodles are pretty common and a lot of people want dogs who don't shed a lot. So I do have a couple breeders that I utilize um, that do doodles, um, but they genetically test and they have been breeding for 16 years, specifically for service dogs. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we see a lot of doodles that we do along mm -hmm. with our labs, our goldens, uh, the occasional German Shepherd. I've trained a couple to for service dogs, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and a few other breeds thrown in there. So do you find the higher drive dogs, you know, the, like the, the, the working line German Shepherds, the Malinois, the Turves, the, you know, the hurt, more herding dogs, border collies, whatever, that they're not as good of a cut or a better cut? for service dogs? I think it's going to depend on the individual um, that you have on the other end of the leash when you turn them over, quite frankly. Um, typically, my uh, if I train a Trevern, it's somebody who's got a law enforcement or military background. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that isn't, doesn't need a, a full mobility dog, um, only because they tend to be a little bit more active and um, a little bit more reactive to to certain things, so which you have to then train out of them to be reactive. Mm -hmm. So, because herding breeds are reactive to motion. 
Well, that's, yeah, that's the whole idea. Yeah. What, what, you know, looking at things like, let's say, prey drive um, or dog, dog reactivity, um, how, are, how are service dogs thought or, or, or asked to behave? I've got my service dog. I'm sitting at a restaurant. Dog is next to me. Somebody walks by with their, you know, their golden doodle pet or their, what, you know, whatever it is. Um, what should my dog as a service dog, how should he react? He should have no reaction, no response to that dog being there. And how do you condition that? Like, how do, how do you, I mean, prob, I, I, get, I get the 80-20 rule, right? But right. how do you get a dog that's obviously, you know, a social type animal? To, right. And again, I know that because Jimmy is like that. He'll lay there, he won't budge. But what's the process? Um, and then I want to talk about the importance of it because I think the importance is more important than the process. Um, what's the process to get the dog to be that, indifferent or totally neutral to the to the other animal a lot of repetitive training to ignore and to watch their handler and then um maybe um michelle take this part of the question how important is it that a real service dog has zero response to another dog going maybe even a dog's going to you know snap at it or, or, or play bow or try to come at it how important is it that my service dog is like, no, I don't see anything. It's extremely important because the thing is, is the, the reason why you have a service dog is because at any moment you will need to utilize that service dog. And so when the dog is working, he is working and yeah. he is not to be deterred by any person or animal, whether it's a dog, a cat, whatever. They mm -hmm. cannot because then they are coming out of their working mode. And so Christy is 100% right. It, this is hours and hours and hours and hours of exposing and training a dog that you see something, you know, squirrels, birds, even flying leaves, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be another animal, right? It's <laughs> you have to train the dog that the whole thing is life is happening, but their focus needs to be on their person at the other end of the leash so that so they I, are able to, to do right. their job. So I have a service dog, right? I'm sitting down and, and just walk me through this because I think I, 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 this is my, my pet peeve this is where I'm going to go with this. I have my service dog. I have, um, I, I have a seizure dog, okay? I, I, I have seizures. And my dog is with me. And oh, somebody comes up, and they're hugging my dog, and they're playing with my dog, and they're petting my dog, and my dog goes over and sees them. And then, oh, the, then the dog plays with their kid and says hi, and his tail's wagging, and I'm having a seizure, right? Why, why do we see so many service dogs? Right? Not, I shouldn't say that. I'm going to rephrase that. Why do we see so many dogs with service dog vests who cannot stay next to their person and even their people and these are the these are the fakers these are the bs guys right i see them at gold's gym i see them at the restaurants i see them at the mall and their dog is over wagging and saying hi to this person and getting cookies nothing worse than a service dog taking cookies from some other person right i can't mm -hmm. imagine anything worse than that <laughs> and i'm going into a seizure and i drop dead you know i swallow my tongue because because the dog isn't there to work me out of the seizure or whatever the dog is designed to do can we talk about the importance of that? Like, how can we how can we get the idiots in the world um, to understand that a real service dog is performing a service, and that service, from what you both both of you ladies said, you don't know when I'm I don't know when I'm going to have a seizure, right? I don't know when I'm going to have a, a whatever the, like a diabetic or shock or something, but that dog doesn't get to say, well, he's going to be fine. I'm going to say hi for a minute. And, uh, and I'm going to go wag my tail and get some cookies and treats and, and hug and kiss this other ki guy or kid or whatever. And my owner dies in the line of me not doing my service. Can, can we just talk about the importance of that? Because it's I want to drive that point home in this in this podcast. So it's extremely important that the dog be trained properly not to engage, first of all. So it shouldn't be running over there wagging its tail wanting to engage and get cookies. Right. Secondly, is education of the public, the general public and those people who have fake service dogs, um, that they are setting up those that are truly disabled to have 
have major problems in that if they're distracting the dog and that person has a seizure, um, if the general public is distracting them, the dog is going to be delayed in doing its job probably. Um, although one that's properly trained should be able to stay focused. So, mm -hmm. well, so I want to talk about that for a second. So tell me what a seizure, a seizure dog, I would guess they call them seizure alert dogs. Mm -hmm. Is that the right term? Or response. Yeah. Seizure response. What does, what does that picture look like? I, do I start to have a seizure? The dog picks up on the, my vibe, my energy, my scent or whatever we're, we're looking at. And then what does that dog do? So the ones that I train um, respond prior to the seizure to alert the owner that one's coming on so that they can get safe. Mm -hmm. And safe means not being going downstairs, et cetera, you know, get to a spot mm -hmm. where they can sit um, and are not going to be put themselves in danger by having that seizure. Um, the ones we also train are to, we train them to get help, to go find somebody to get help, assistance, mm -hmm. as well as to get the medicine. So a lot of our um, people that have seizures have medicine pouches that are available for the dog and the dog gets them um, as either, as they're bringing a person back to assist the individual or um, after they get the person there, they go and they get the medication. I mean, this is a lot of training. This is a yes. lot of this. There's, there's a lot that goes into this. It's not just, oh, you know, I got the dog off death row at the shelter and it's my service dog and I got the vest and I can right. prove it because I've yeah. got the ID card too, right? And you bought it online. <laughs> yeah. I mean, doesn't it, doesn't it tick you, you ladies off? I mean, honestly, I mean, Absolutely. I don't even do this for a living. I mean, Absolutely. if I was you, I'd be punching people in the face every day with this. I mean, it's just... <laughs> I can't There's imagine. laws against that, though. <laughs> Some, yeah. The punching the people, that's the law yeah. But um, yeah. that we can't do. However, the positive thing, though, is currently, so in as of 2022, in the United States, there are 33 states that have laws that will, if a person is fraudulently representing their pet dog as a service dog, that there are now laws in place that that person, there are consequences to that individual. But um, how enforceable we, is it really? How, how enforceable well, is it? It's enforceable. That? The problem is proving it. Okay. So, that, so how provable is that, um, Michelle? Well, I guess it depends on what it is. If if your quote service dog bit my dog, mm -hmm. uh, that's a pretty provable thing. Well, then um, it's too late. Right. Right. But that is but right. now it's ruined a really good service dog. Right. The, the dog is a, pretty much going to be a wash if the dog gets bit. Potentially. Yeah. So 2000 hours right. plus it's a complete wash. The pain and the anguish of the person having to get rid of their dog, whatever. It's now a wash. But how can stay? And again, th th I, this is a question I don't know the answer to. But how can law enforcement, I mean, again, I think, you know, we're looking at, there's too many laws in the country the way it is, but not enough for the right reasons like this. How do we, how can, how can that law be enforced? I see somebody, okay, I know, I know it's a fake service dog, right? I can ask the person according to the ADA, what service is your dog trained to perform for you? Is that, am I right on that? Is that the legal, is that all I can do? And is the dog a service dog? Right. So, and of course, you're going to say dog's... yes. Yes, my dog is a service dog. My dog is a seizure alert dog. Right. That's what they're going to say, or or whatever, because that's an easy one to pull through. It's obviously not a seeing eye dog because I'm I'm not blind. But um, you know, and I I think there are important things. My mother is crippled. My mother is extremely handicapped. I've, I've have other friends who are handicapped. They deserve these animals. The the, the issue is how do we protect the rights of a handicapped person to have a service dog and a service dog to be protected to not have to be around other fake service dogs right and again people can say well they'll be exposed to in the street but that's different if there's another dog in the street that's that dog can get away but if it's in a restaurant or at a gym or you know in a, in a small grocery store like down the street here where everybody's got their do fake service dogs um my dog can't get away my dog's prov providing a service getting me through the aisle or whatever and now this other dog is coming down the aisle and it's aggressive or it's playful or whatever and it's messing up my dog. How do we, how can that law be better enforced 
for let's say a shop owner can the shop owner go well you know um it's, can can they ask you to leave can that shop owner say hey your your service dog is um acting rambunctious and i need to ask it to leave there yes, are standards of behavior if, oh sorry right. okay. what, michelle why don't you take sorry. that one so <laughs> just i don't want to put you both to talk go ahead right so yes there is there are even with the ada there are if the dog is not behaving appropriately the the shop owner the business owner can ask the individual to remove the dog they cannot not allow the the human to come back and get the service right mm -hmm. or get mm -hmm. the groceries or whatever but if a dog is not behaving appropriately because there are like christy was saying standards of behaviors for service dogs if that dog is not is not is not performing to that level they can be asked to leave the challenge goes always to education and empowerment of people to to actually say i'm sorry your dog is acting inappropriately i ask you my two questions is that a service dog and what task has that dog been trained to perform and if the person cannot answer those questions then the shop owner should ask get out you have to leave but a lot mm -hmm. of times people don't want to people want to confront for some things and they don't want to confront for other things well, I think and they're so, afraid of being sued. I think I think in this litigious society, I think you know they're going to they're they're afraid because some lawyer will take the case for sure. Right. I mean, lawyers you know or, or, or can be very horrible people. Not they're not all horrible people, but they can be because it's a it's a deep pocket. Oh, you know, the grocery store said it's not a service dog and threw them out. We're going to sue you for twenty million dollars, and they're going to get something, right? So, so document that that business owner being educated and then documenting the inappropriate behavior is a way they keep themselves not being sued. Talk about that. How do you do that? And I love it. So you can document it. I mean, document so and so had their dog in here. It was doing this inappropriate behavior, whatever it is. And um, if they document it, put the date and time and then they've at least got some documentation that would cover them should that person mm -hmm. come back and say, you know, that they denied me access when they with my dog, which they shouldn't have. But if your dog has inappropriate behaviors, um, you know, we do have the ISCP service dog committee does have a business education package as well that is available to any business owner anywhere that wants to get it off of our website or email us and ask us for it so that we can help empower them to make sure that they are making appropriate decisions on whether a dog should be a, a quote service dog. And I'll say quote, mm -hmm. because it may or may not be a service dog, but even a service dog, if it's inappropriately trained or doesn't sure. have those standards of behavior can be denied access. I want to put a link to that, Christy. I want to put a link to that in this video for business owners to have access to this information. I think that's really important. Oh, I want mm -hmm. you to address for a second these standards of behavior that we have for service dogs. Is it like a, a quick is it qu a quick list you can give me that? Yeah, it's pretty quick. Do you want to start? Me? No, I can't. You got to do no, it. No, not you. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Michelle, do you want to start or do you want me to keep going? <laughs> Either one. So, of you. Well, one of the one of the things is that the dog cannot inappropriately eliminate mm -hmm. so that's you know a dog can't just go to the bathroom wherever it wants to go to the bathroom okay. the dog is not allowed to uh, solicit um attention from a from another human being or another okay. animal okay. um they need to remain unobtrusive wherever they are um, they should not be, you know, sniffing, eating food off of the ground. They should never be eating food from the table. So if you're out with your service dog, you're not to be feeding them at mm -hmm. the table at the restaurant where you're at. Um, so Christy, they what? should always have four on the floor. So when you see them in a shopping cart or 
on a motorized scooter, probably not a service dog, mm-hmm. um, cause those are not behaviors that are standard. Um, the only time that a dog should be off had not have four on the floors if it's tasking. So such as getting an object for the owner where it has to, you know, put its feet up on something to get yeah. it, et cetera. They should always be under control of the handler, mm-hmm. the human. Mm-hmm. So the thing is, is that, and that can be because depending on the person's disability, if the person's disability, if they're a paraplegic or don't have use of their arms, then the dog would be under verbal control mm-hmm. of the, of the individual. So, because that's the key thing is that if your dog does an unwanted behavior it barks are you able to get your are you able to is your dog under control that you can immediately stop that behavior if it wasn't an alert bark right like if he was so um they're also not allowed to have any aggressive behavior such as growling snarling etc they shouldn't be lunging at dogs or people they should ha- be well groomed and well kept so not a dog that's rolled in the mud and just you know comes <laughs> <Right>. out <laughs> um l- l- let's talk about something because uh, this is a fascinating concept for me because from what i've understood about service dogs that throughout training well, f- let's start with selection first then training then placing dogs get washed out right yeah. so you know the, the so many of these service dogs that i see fake service dogs sorry i i like to call them tr- you know well you know pets with a vest because that's really what they are they <laughs> you know they have all these things but um you know if i have a if i get a dog and i you know i train it to be my service dog and i get the vest and the and the id card online for 39 dollars, and now i've got the dog and the dog becomes you know, let, let's say it, 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 it helps me with a couple of things. But when that dog becomes unable to do that task, if I really have a disability and I really require a do, dog to do that task, in theory, I would need to wash that dog, right? Which, and when I say wash the dog, for those people who are watching from other countries, washing a dog means um, washing out. In other words, the dog is now not able to do the service dog work and I get another dog. That dog then goes to another home. I don't get to keep it and say, oh, well, you know, I'll just, I'll keep him anyway. I need to get a dog that's going to do the task. And it happens with guide dogs all the time. They get attacked or they just, they, they, they become tired of doing the task, stubborn or whatever, and they're not going to do it anymore. Now that dog gets taken away from me, gets put in a home. And obviously, like you said, Christy, you put them in very good pet homes and everything like that. But now I get another dog. So people who train their own service dogs, um, is, is that something? I'm sure it's possible, right? I'm sure it's possible. But how probable and how likely and how successful is it for people who claim to train their own service dogs? That's a really hard one. I know. Because and there would, are some people that do well training their own and others do not. And others that do well recognizing that their dog needs to be washed and others that do not. Mm-hmm. Michelle, you have something you want to add to that? Well, I was just going to say that um, there's also the other component. Washing a dog because they're unable to perform the job prior to being placed into service so Mm -hmm. if a dog has been gone through training and is a service dog and then they either out they you know they cannot physically do the job or they mentally can't do the job then those Mm -hmm. dogs get retired um because it's it's that their ability to continue to perform the task that they were trained to do, they're no longer able to do it. Washing a dog out, in my perspective, is within that training period of time that the dog is, you know, we have our dogs medically evaluated at at certain points in the dog's life to ensure Mm -hmm. that they are um, 
structurally sound and able to do the work that we're asking them to do. And if they have bad hips, then, then we do wash them from the program. If they have, you know, any difficulties with their vision, then they get washed out. If mm -hmm. so, there's like a medical reasons why a dog would not be able to continue in a service dog training program. The other part of it is the temperament of the dog. Or if something occurred during the training that is an un unrecoverable for the dog. So if the dog was attacked by another dog and now every time it sees a dog, it has a negative reaction, whatever that reaction might be, that dog is not going to be able to continue in training mm -hmm because they're not stable now to do the, the work that they've been asked to do, which is don't let anything bother you, right? You have to stay focused on, on your work. And it is, it's a very hard thing, especially with people who are training their own service dogs, because you, the part that nobody's, we haven't talked about is the emotional connection mm -hmm. right. that yeah. people have, you know, they've gotten this dog, you know, either as a puppy or the death row dog or whatever. And so they're emotionally invested that no matter what, what right. it is, this dog is going to be my service dog, no matter mm -hmm. what, because, you know, I've, I've invested all this time and energy and money. And it's, you know, again, I think it goes back to education. So if you are going to, train your own service dog to at least reach out and get support from a service dog trainer mm -hmm. to help you um, navigate the whole thing. Because the other part of it is you have to know the laws in your state, mm -hmm. right? What are your, what are your rights um, and what are your responsibilities? And so some people, you know, if you're if you're trying to go it alone, I mean, you're really just trying to figure everything out by yourself, mm -hmm. and and that is, in itself can be overwhelming. So, I think you know, like Christy said, there are individuals that are successful training their own service dogs, but I also think that those successful individuals have a support system mm -hmm. that is helping them. Um, navigate and move through and you know do the do the best by the dog as just, well as the person just curiously christy this is a question for you what is of all the different service do, do, now have you ever trained a, a guide dog a, a seeing eye dog I have trained a dog for somebody that was legally blind, but not okay. born blind. Typically, okay. if I need, if the client needs a seeing eye dog or a hearing dog because they were born blind or deaf, I send them to the foundations for those okay. because those are the experts in that field. What What do you think, as a trainer who's done this forever, if you were to rank the, the, the service skills, what do you think is the easiest one to train? Well, you know, actually, I don't want, I don't want to do that because everybody's going to pick that one. Um, <laughs> what do you think is the most complicated thing to train a dog to do? Would it be being a, a seeing eye dog or would it be being a, a diabetic dog, a mobility dog? What, what's the hardest yeah. one for the dog, first of all, and then for the trainer to train? So for the dog, anything that involves scent is probably the easiest one as long as sure. the trainer understands scent mm -hmm. in the dog's in the dog's eyes, the dog sees the world through its nose. So mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a no brainer for the dog, not necessarily for the handler because we're dealing with unknowns. Um, and you know, when you're dealing with scent work, the dogs. So my diabetic alert dogs alert on average thirty minutes prior to a change in a CGM. So it's hard to. CGM? That's the uh, pump that uh, measures blood sugar uh, in the individual. So they, so when they carry tell them the whether race, they're right? going high or low. Yep, it's typically implantable. Okay. And um, so, but you know, when you first see that, it's hard to believe the dog, oh, this dog's false alerting. You know, mm -hmm. that's what I get from a lot of people. No, it's not, because then 30 mm -hmm. minutes later, their blood sugar crashes. Um, 
So there's the human component is always going to be the trickier thing. I think if you're good at marking things for the dog, any of the task work and stuff that we do is relatively easy. The hard part is getting it easy for the dog through distractions. Mm -hmm. um, probably the hardest thing I've ever taught is that a dog to help somebody get dressed. Mm. Transfers, wow. you know, pulling up, um, all the mobi other mobility stuff is probably relatively easy, but it can be very tricky teaching the dog to help somebody put on socks and pants and shirts and things like that. Wow, that's amazing. That's an amazing task. Yeah. yeah. And and that would be a really Do you think a service dog, um, Michelle, is should should it be required that a service dog is performing a task that the person cannot do without that dog? Would that be a legal standard? I think pretty much that's what a service dog does. I mean, the task that they've been trained to do is a task that the individual because of their disability cannot perform. So whether it's getting dressed or if they are going into, you know, getting medication that they, that they are not able to get because if they're starting to have a seizure or if it's that an individual who has dropped something and they physically aren't able to bend over and pick it up. Right. So it, Definitely. It has to be something that the person, you know, the dog needs to be doing the task that the human can't do themselves. So I, I want to touch on something because I'm seeing this more and more now. Um, people, and I see this at, at Gold's Gym, so I, I'm going to throw it out there. People have their service dogs, their, their, their pets with a vest, off leash, right? It, it, as, as professional service dog trainers, do you think that um, a service dog can perform a task off leash, being completely off leash? Christy? I do. I do. Um, if it's been trained properly, we have clients that, due to paralysis and stuff, cannot manage the, the leash. So oh, okay. the dogs are under voice command and um, they do perfectly fine. Um, I have a lot of clients that um, have hemiparalysis, so paralyzed on one side, mm -hmm. and um, they'll do, you know, occasionally they'll do crossbody leashes, um, but even then, sometimes it's difficult for them, so off-lead is what they do. But the yeah. dogs are under complete control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some, is there, there's some, some humming in the background somewhere. That would be my house. Oh, so oh, that's yours. Okay. I'm going to just, all right, hang on. I'm just going to mute this for one second. Okay. 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 Um, so and another thing, Christy, so I, that's a great point, by the way, you know, cause I've always said a service dog should be on a leash, but yeah, if a person is paralyzed, then there is no way they can, they can hold the leash. Right. So that dog wouldn't, would not be able to perform that service, um, as well or, or at all. If, if, the, if the person was, if the dog was leashed. Right. So that's a great example. But I mean, I see, people with their dogs off leash. So, you know, for the, that would be the rarest exception if the dog was off leash. We would know Correct. that person is very seriously impaired and that dog mm -hmm. is, you know, under the control. He's not walking around with an e-collar on the dog and, and kind of keeping it and, and feeding it treats the whole time. That would not be a, probably a real service dog, would it? Probably not. Okay. Um, right. You know, like I said, I, have, I do have a lot of clients that use crossbody leashes due to physical constraints. Yeah. Um, but the, it's a crossbody leash. It's still um, attached to them. Mm -hmm. um, even, even you know, some of my um, clients that are in wheelchairs, and as long as their upper extremities are not paralyzed, they they typically still use a leash. Mm -hmm. um, so one question I have, and I've this is a true curiosity question: is if I have a pet, right? I've got a you know a little. Yorkie poo or whatever. I mean, it was my little dog. Um, and now I'm going to get a service dog because I, I'm, you know, I have a hard, my, I have a really bad back and I need a dog for mobility, stability, whatever it is. Is, do you guys think, or do you guys train the dogs? Can, can I have a, a pet dog and a service dog in my house? Absolutely. Okay. And they don't interfere with each other. They shouldn't. No. Okay. How, how do we assure that? Like if my Yorkie poo keeps jumping up on my 
my service or my, my stability dog or whatever, is that something that you then work with the owner to say, okay, this dog it shouldn't be doing that because it's inhibiting him from doing his work? I, I do only because I don't think it's appropriate to, mm -hmm. you know, have one dog annoying the other dog constantly. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would work with the, the person to correct that behavior in the other dog, but mm -hmm. I've already taught that service dog to ignore that behavior mm -hmm. as well. And they can do that even if it's day after day, hour after hour, week after week, month after month, the dog just keeps jumping in his face. Doesn't it become a new learned behavior with the dogs at some point going to go, you know what, I'm going to play. That's it. Christy's not here. We just don't let it happen. So whether I'm here or not, okay. my, so you're, my you're trying disabled to person, it. right? yes, absolutely. Okay. But I'm not one of the trainers. I do know because I get people all the time that are told if they have existing pets to, in order to have a service dog, they have to get rid of those pets. Mm -hmm. That's not fair. I don't, I just train the service dog to be the best that it can be mm -hmm. regardless of what other pets are in the household. And I, I teach, I coach the, the individuals on how to ensure that those other pets are not doing things that are dangerous to the service dog and to the service dog's training. Looking at this, because you're saying there's a lot of training involved in this, and this is a very select dog is going to become a service dog. What do the what do service dogs cost? I mean, and how do people afford a dog? I mean, if it's 2000 hours of training, um, and I'm not asking for your price on your dogs, but I'm just saying, right. what, what is a range that somebody would look at for, you know, they need a diabetic alert dog or a seizure alert dog. What, what does that cost on the average? I mean, again, it's going to be different in New York, California, or, you know, Virginia yeah. and Texas, but what, what is it? $2,000? Is it $25,000? Oh no, probably between 20 and 30,000. Easy. Okay. And a so it's lot a big of, investment. It is. Mm -hmm. And so there are organizations that there's no upfront cost to the individual to get the dog, but you also have to be able to take care of the dog. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even if you got your service dog from a nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. like, you know, a guide dog organization, mm -hmm who typically don't charge, you know, the visually impaired person for a dog, but you mm -hmm. as the human, you mm -hmm. still have to be able to care for the dog. You have to feed the dog and take the dog sure. to the vet and things mm -hmm. like that. So that's all part of the screening process too. When you're looking at, you know, the human side as well as the dog side, what is going to make the most successful client? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is somebody who is able to you know care for the dog because the dog really cannot care for themselves i mean the dog's been trained to do their work but mm -hmm. they need the human to feed them and to mm -hmm. let them go outside to go to the bathroom and things like that so well, I think, that's I think why my, my main point with it is you know that these dogs are a huge investment for people it's not just, you know, getting a dog and right. yeah, I took it because this is a thing that's very, very common, by the way. I don't know if you, you ladies are, are in touch with this, but I get people all the time who say, oh, you know, can you sign off on this dog being a service dog or, you know, or I, I just need a, I need a, you know, I need a, a, tra a trainer to sign off, which is insane to me that you would ask, you know, somebody who doesn't have, I mean, a, a background, and I'm, I'm fine to admit what I don't know. Like, I don't know how to train a, sur a seizure alert dog. It, it's, it's completely mm -hmm. green to me. I get it. It's a scent thing, but it's it, this is a very professional thing. Um, if somebody needs this dog, they're going to invest $30,000 in this dog. We should have some kind of a degree of respect with this dog and, and of the person who invested this money and who needs this dog who's going to have a hard time functioning without it, not to let, you know, first of all, I think people who just start, to, they see a dog, I mean, we need common sense that people, if I see that's a dog, it's got a service dog vest on, even if it's a fake service dog, I shouldn't approach it. I shouldn't talk to it. I shouldn't touch it. I shouldn't, you know, acknowledge it. I should just move on and keep walking, you know, and not say, oh, what a cute puppy. Is he a service dog? Well, you're an idiot because you just ruined, you know, that's the first rule, you know, of, uh, you know, the first rule of Fight Club, you know, that's like, they don't understand that. <laughs> Uh, it, it, you know, there, that education has to somehow get out there. I mean, there's no penalty for me if I go up 
and I find somebody's got a service dog and I start giving it cookies and cuddling and kissing it, I can't get arrested for that, right? No, you cannot. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. I guess be it could idea, be considered though. some type of assault. But yeah, right. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what, one thing I'd really like to focus on is I think we should put a link in this video so that people can learn more from both sides. One is if you really legitimately need a service dog, right? You really do have diabetes or seizures or whatever, what you should expect. Because just having your pet and saying it's a service dog, and then God forbid you do have a seizure and your dog is not skilled in what mm -hmm. to do, you're gonna die, right? And, and that's not fair. And two, in taking your dog, and I, I think this is the bigger part. I mean, I love my dog. I would love to take my dog with me everywhere I go. But it's not fair because, you know, I mean, I think w on one side, I think America should be more f open with taking dogs into public places. I think America is really behind the ball on that. In Europe, you know, you can take your dog into the store so you don't have to lie about it. So here you have to make these lies up. We're getting better about it but we're getting better about it because people are scanning the system, especially the airplane thing. The airplane thing is a huge issue for me. I, I was on a flight going back to Florida one day, and I, actually, I think it was the trip when I went to IACP. There was a guy who had a fake service dog and a cat in a backpack, right, on a plane. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, I mean, anything weirder than that. Um, except if he had a service peacock with him. But the, he was like, it was just completely insane to me that he... He, he was allowed on the plane and, you know, he's going to, he's, he made some noise and stuff so people can't say anything, but you know, sir, the plane thing I think is the number one thing that, you know, if I can kind of divert what I was going to say, seeing fake service on a plane, because people want to take their dogs with them. They want, I'm going to see my mom. I'm going to be gone for 10 days. I don't want to board my dog. I want to take my dog with me. I'm going to put a vest on him and I'm going to take him on the plane. What's um, going on with that? Because I think, didn't I read something that um, IACP is working with American Airlines or something? Is there something, um, am, I, am I skewing this? So IACP is a, has, gone, has um, entered into a partnership with ASDEC is the name of the organization. Mm -hmm. And so they developed a service dog pass program. So this is an optional volunteer program. American Airlines is the airline that is piloting this service dog pass program. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that program is for individuals who who have the service dog pass. So they don't have to, every time they fly, fill out the Department of Transportation forms. But those forms, if, you, if you're if you not part of ASDEC and the Service Dog Pass Program, if you're just a, an individual with your service dog, mm -hmm. you have to fill out the DOT forms. And once the Air Carrier Access Act just got revised that says, you know, only service dogs are allowed to travel you know, on planes, unless it's a small dog in a carrier, mm -hmm. um, you have to fill out those DOT forms. And so nobody should be allowed to be on a plane that those forms haven't been filled out and verified. So, I didn't know about I that. Mean, I, I've never heard of that. So I, if I, I'm going to, I'm going to the airport now and I'm going to take my dog as a, as a fake service dog. So what's the procedure? What do I have to do? Well, before you, if you show up then to your, when you're checking into your flight, yeah. they can pull up that information and make sure you filled out that paperwork. I mean, that's, you know, there's the, the first gatekeeper is the, you know, at, at, before you even get to the gate, you have to, your dog has to have been, you have to verify that you filled out those that paperwork. Oh, I didn't know and that. And even I, I know people have flown without that. So, you, are you saying that I can't step foot on a plane with my fake service dog unless I filled out that Department of Transportation form? Yes, I and I the wow. the fact that in, individuals who have legitimate service dogs sometimes yeah. are challenged. 
And so the thing is, is the, the, all that paperwork, it's on any flight because when you're, like if you're a service dog hand user and you are, are going to buy a ticket, you, I, you are, you say you're traveling with your service dog mm -hmm. and that like for United, that's identified on your ticket when you're there, that they know that you have, you're flying with a service dog and you have filled out the paperwork online that attests to the fact that yes your dog is a service dog and they have you know all the different criteria that you have to do the other thing is i mean christy can even speak on because she travels to place her service dogs mm -hmm. outside of the state and so she's had to fill out the forms too just as a trainer transporting a service dog to the internet. yeah the dot form has a checkbox that you have to check if you are a disabled individual that asks that verifies and attests that the dog does perform a task for you and if you don't check that box there's another spot to be filled out that where you explain why so when i'm taking a service dog to the disabled individual or taking it to visit their disabled individual i fill it out i do not check the task box i check i check and fill in the box and the lines that say that I'm a professional trainer transporting the service dog. Mm -hmm. So, because we got to wrap this up at some point here, right? I could talk to you guys for hours about <laughs> ladies, for, but I would say guys, it's a sexist thing, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I could talk to you ladies for hours about this because I love your passion about this and your, your amazing skill. Um, I want to end it with Christy and I want to ask you this question. Um, Training a dog to go in a grocery store, okay, you know, we can put a vest on him and kind of walk him through a grocery store, Home Depot, or whatever. But training a dog to go on a plane seems like kind of a kind of an insurmountable task. I know that the guide dogs have a deal with an airline where they kind of take the puppies on, they kind of acclimate them to that. What's your procedure? Because I know that that the whole the, the compression, the, the cabin compression, the sounds, the the weird, you know, uh, the, 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 the context of being in a plane is very weird for a dog. How do you and at what point do you walk me through that in a in a brief um, story? Get that dog used to that. And is it something that all your service dogs need to know how to do is be on a plane? So we do we do a lot of um public access stuff where we go on like sky trams and stuff. And we find the sky trams are other than the compression and decompression are fairly sim si uh, fairly similar to what the noises that, encountered tram? in the plane. It's like a, um, it's a rail system that is used oh, oh, to, oh. for people to go between terminals. Got so um, in Phoenix, it's above ground and mm -hmm. it's very noisy and lots of, lots of vibration, et cetera. Um, I quite frankly have never in all my years of flying with dogs had an issue with a dog that I trained to curl up in the floor of my vehicle to walking mm -hmm. onto a plane. Um, the first time you take off or land, when they slide a little bit, and once mm -hmm. typically after the first time, which they might sit up and look around, mm -hmm. then um, they typically don't even get up. I've never had a dog react negatively to that, but then I only train and transport yeah. sound dogs. But you're also going through a huge selection process, right? I mean, you see Correct. if you have a really sharp or a really skittish dog early mm -hmm. on, that dog's not going to get in your program. Correct. You know, I'm thinking people who have these dogs who, who have some proclivity to being, you know, hypersensitive to noise or environmental stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then they go, well, you know, I can get the dog fine. But you know, when you're 30,000 feet up, if this dog panics and bites somebody's face off, um, you know, that's a whole nother story. And I think that Correct. that does happen with these, with these, you know, pets with a vest. They're just, and it, you know, of the really, of all of this, as much as I detest the people, I feel so sorry for the dog because they're putting the dog in a situation that is so unfair to the dog. Correct. I just traveled with a young puppy that we've got in training here to visit his, um, down syndrome boy. And, um, during that the flights that i had i had stewardesses come up and go oh my god it's so refreshing to see a real service dog and a properly trained one and they you know they tell me about these dogs that get on the plane with their the supposed service dogs are probably a pets in a vest like you said mm -hmm. and they spend more of the time 
hiding in a corner of the galley with mm -hmm. the um, the the stewardesses than they do with the disabled individual, which means they're also not doing their job. Well, there's no if real they're job, truly so you know. a service dog. Yeah, there's no real job. <laughs> the job is just yeah. being a good friend. You know, you're a good friend <laughs> along for the ride. Um, yeah. I it, this is a really this I'd like to continue this at some point. Maybe. Um, people who watch the video want to put some comments down below, some questions and stuff like that. And we can kind of readdress these things with some more detailed things from people. But I would like to put the um, IACP, which I think is a fantastic organization. Um, I think this organization does so much for the, the betterment of dogs, the betterment of dog trainers, the betterment of the, the art of dog training. I'm just very proud to be associated with it. Um, I want to put some links up to that, that if somebody wants to really... I mean, I think it's a great service you do, obviously. Um, I, I do think it's a horrible service people do when they just sign off on fake service dogs. But maybe we can put some links in the video description um, of what people, how, how can I learn to be a service dog trainer? I, I really I have a passion for this, and I sincerely want to embrace it. Um, these guidelines that we expect of the dogs and the things that people can have. Um, you guys can send me those um, separately, and I'll put them in the description down below. Um, and I'm, I'm really open to hearing people's questions um, and, and not, I don't really want to see comments on below like, oh, I trained my dog to my own service. Again, you can do it. Sure, you can do it. You know, it, you can do a lot of things. But I, I'm really concerned that I, in my heart, want to protect truly handicapped people who have true service dogs. Those dogs need the protection. We're talking about a dog that's $30,000. We're talking about a dog that um, takes two years to train per se, right? We're talking about a dog that's selectively um, chosen, maybe not, so, but you're, you're also talking, uh, Christy, mm -hmm. about very, very selective breeding that these breeders are, you know, right. very specific. And, and Guide Dogs um, has an amazing breeding program that they do. And all these, you know, I think organizations really do a lot of work to it. So um, it, it, unless you guys have anything to add, I just want to thank you for being on the show. Is there anything that I missed or anything that... Um, you guys want to touch on as a, as a, as a, as a cap off on this? I don't think so. And now mm -hmm. we just appreciate your time and your interest. And, um, I, I guess I can maybe speak for Christy, but I can speak for myself. Happy to, you know, if people have questions or follow up, I mean, I will also provide if you want our, you know, email address. So mm -hmm. if individuals have specific questions, um, I know IACP is working on developing a mentor program. And so for not just service dog trainers, but for dog trainers and other mm -hmm. people like that. So um, our whole mission is really education. Yeah. And the more yeah. we can yeah. educate people, um, and, and that if if you see something and you report it, that at some point, you know, there will be stronger consequences to those people that are, you know, misrepresenting their pet as a service dog. I um, love that. Yeah. So it's. Um, yeah. So it's something we're working on. So well, I, let's let's keep going on it because I think, you know, we need to, I, you know, just I, I detest people. It's just that I could get on a whole nother thing about people with the fake handicapped placards in their cars. That drives me nuts, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother show. Um, all right. So, ladies, thank you so much. I'm going to put links to both of you um, as well. And um, and Christy, maybe um, since you do this, you know, if people are looking for a real service dog, you can kind of maybe guide them in a direction where they could you probably have friends or sorry, friends, but people, you know, all over the country that probably do this and you do it. Um, so, you know, if you really need a real service dog, th th there's a great option for you because people always ask about that, but yeah. it is expensive. It, it's, it's something that takes, you know, to think about what you would charge per hour and 2000 hours is a, is a long time. You know, I mean, it's not a, yeah. you know, and, and I respect that because I, I can't imagine how much I would charge for a dog that spent 2000 hours. I don't think it would ever leave. I think it'd be too attached to it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Kudos to you for being able to do it. I, just, I, I can't even do a board and train. As soon as I, the dog's in my house for a couple of days, I'm, I'm addicted. So um, anyway. So if I can, so Robert, just yeah. as a side note. So although Christy has a lot more experience, I also train service dogs. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to put both of your I links have, down. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, I want to. Yeah, I she mean, has a lot more varied. I stick in the broader. veteran population, so <laughs> well, she's broader than I am. I'm very narrow focused. Well, both of you guys. You know, I don't know that I like the sounds of that broader. <laughs> yeah, broader, and then, yeah. <laughs> A larger but, I mean, let's get both of your information, because, again, you guys are also in two different areas of the country, right? Michelle, you're in Phoenix? She's no, in I'm Phoenix. in Phoenix. Oh, okay. I'm Christy, in you're Virginia. In Phoenix. You're in Virginia. Okay, I got it. Okay. I knew one of you was in Phoenix, one of you was in Virginia. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, look, fantastic. This is a great chat. Um, big shout out to the IACP um, for, for, for tackling something like this. I think it's not an easy task, and I commend them for getting on board, because this is not an easy topic, and I think... It's one, it may not be popular, but it's, it's, it's very, very, very important. So I'm glad um, to be associated with an organization that is doing that. And uh, I'm going to look for questions and hopefully we can, we can continue our chat. Okay. Sounds Thank you, great. Robert. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.